Hey, I'm Steve Lee, and this is Cliffhanger, a classic mission from Modern Warfare 2. This interview is another big chat with Jason McCord and Mackie McCandlish, where we break down what I think is a pretty unique creative process for level design. And as you'll see, I found it genuinely surprising, because it's so different to anything I've experienced on projects that I've worked on. Near the end, we also talk about the subtle but important details in how we design and script things, so that players are genuinely having the exciting experience and they're not just watching it happen on the screen, which for me is what level design is all about. So I hope you find this interesting. Here it is. Uh, Jason, you were kind of, were you kind of the main level designer on it? And you mentioned Mackie was the scripter or how, how does that relationship work? Because I've never worked in a studio where the scripter is actually a different role to, a, to the level designer. And so I'm really curious how yeah. that even... Tell, tell it from the standpoint of maybe give us an example from Treyarch times and then from oh, the contrast is really interesting. Too. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, when I started at Treyarch, it was, um, it was, pr they were pretty separate roles. They were like straight up scripter, gameplay scripter and straight up level designer. And you would put them in the office together and you'd work on a level together and you just bounce ideas off of each other. And I'd be like, I checked in the latest geo and he'd be like, okay, I'm going to go script the thing. Um, and at IW, it was, there was some similarities there, but it was a lot more. What I remember about Cliffhanger was I got there and that was the first map I worked on it at IW when I, when I got there. I mean, I, they had me work, they had me like, they, we were trying to figure out if we were making Modern Warfare 2 or some other game at that time. It was right after they shipped COD 4. Um, right. And so there was a lot of conversations in the, in the, uh, in the pit, oh, I see whether know. or not the next Call of Duty would be Modern Warfare. Yeah, well, Modern the next Warfare game, game would be Modern Warfare Two or a different game. Oh, wow. after Modern Warfare One, yeah, after the game, we would kind of sway before we go back. Yeah, right, right. Okay. And I feel like I, I don't know if this is actually true, but I feel like they had enough uh, pull at Activision after COD Four to say like we want to make a different, we want to make a non Call of Duty game. Um, and so that that decision was being made. And so when I got there, they were like. You know, new guy, you look like you can build levels, cool. Go like keep like sit with the geo guys and make yourself busy while we all figure out what game we're gonna make. Um and so I did make like a little uh piece of geo that was just like a, a, a neighborhood that I was trying to make into a multiplayer map and it was pretty bad. And <laughs> after maybe a month of that, they were like, Why don't you work on this instead? Or maybe I asked to work on it. I don't remember how that went. But Fakuda, Steve Fakuda um, was a lead designer at the time. And I think he paper designed the mission. And the paper design was, it was not a layout. It was an experience. You know, you would describe the experience and he would pitch it. And Steve's really good about pitching. This is a master class at pitching. He'll He'll pull up his phone and put music on and put it down and pitch his idea. And he'll like go into to, um, accents and stuff. It was <laughs> great. like he'll, he'll do a British accent for price and stuff. Nice. Um, so he pitched cliffhanger mission and had all these, these moments of um, these touchstones, you know, like when you're in the, when you're in the, the snowstorm and you're getting messages from, from price about, what to do like, or sorry from soap <clears throat> wait yeah soap was there right well, well during the design it was price it was a late switch okay. that we decided to put price in prison and blah 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 yeah, yeah yeah so your um price was supposed price was in the snowstorm somewhere watching and telling you what to do and that's basically what we what shipped but you but soap was doing that and uh you know the touchdown was like it's like he's morpheus i remember this very clearly it was like He's Morpheus. He can see the Matrix, and you're in the Matrix. And that's like, he's like telling you, like, there's a guy behind the there's a guy behind the door, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the kind of direction. And then just go build whatever, go build your map, go build the layout to whatever you you think it should be based off of the experience that was pitched by Steve. Um, right. And that was that was really the freedom that you get. That, that I got at Infinity War to build whatever I thought was cool and then just show the guys and be like, this is what I think would work. And then they would run with it. Mm -hmm. And it, it was awesome. It was. Yeah. That strikes me as, as that was something I, there's a lot of things about Call of Duty 
uh, as a franchise, that strikes me as a um, an amazing place to to be a level designer in the sense that there's a lot of a lot of it checks all the boxes for like what empowers a level designer. I think yeah. you know, things like working on the same kind of like, like sequels in the same kind of game repeatedly with the same team and that institutional knowledge that builds up over time. Uh, the tech already being there. I, I don't know how many times in the Call of Duty franchise the tech was completely rehauled and stuff, but it feels like the tech was often quite similar. And so you could, I could imagine that you could ship Modern Warfare One, and then when it comes to prototyping Modern Warfare Two, it's like you can just go because you've got it's all there, right? Yeah. And uh, and and even even the the mission structure of the, mo- the Modern Warfare games where it has that kind of globe trotting. This time we're in Russia. This time we're in uh, Britain or whatever, and then that means that every mission is really self-contained and level designers can just kind of do their own movie like in in, in each place. That's the impression I got, you know? I Um, I, want to put a little more emphasis on, you said Call of Duty gives you these opportunities, but it was the difference between the two approaches that McCord went through is significant. See, Hmm. the, 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 think about how different it is for Cliffhanger where the design was already done. It wasn't, totally drawn out but the design was done the idea was already crystallized and you believed in it before you even started before you put a brush into radiant and then as level designer you own the level at that point you have to build it and it has to work you have to really believe what you're making is going to work so when the scripter comes in there you have a fully built level and that torch is then really being passed and now the scripter owns the level and they have to actually now was there some overlap there's some crossover of course there was like for the cliffhanger climbing there was some realities that had to really get worked out to to mm-hmm. make it um there had to be jason was smart about this stuff though and that this is one of the reasons he was always a designer that you as a scripter wanted was because he was gonna he knew where to leave the flexibility mm-hmm. and right. that's so different than hey you two guys in a room make a level maybe it's this idea not here's a design and I'm confident and I'm presenting it and I believe in it, but here's an idea. And the difference that gives you is so much more ownership over your work, even though you're not in the, in the previous model where it's the, where it's geo and scripter building it together. The entire thing is kind of a, a blend of them. Whereas in this other one, the design has autonomy, the level has autonomy, and then the scripting does. And sometimes you get the right person with the right talent and they actually do multiple of those steps, but they're not doing them all at once either. They're still doing hmm. the design, which is presented to the whole team, by, gets buy-in, the level geo part. The level geo gets finished before we start scripting it. Yeah, Steve, think, oh, okay. about, think about I already had a level to shippable, finished quality before Mackie started scripting it. Well, so that, wow, that's, and I didn't put AI in there. That's kinds of interesting to me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So that's like, first of all, that, that as a level designer, you're very, it sounds like then you must be quite talented as an artist to do that. Or, or there's all the assets that you want already made for you. Did you ever, were you placing assets that were already made by an art team or? Well, I mean, I didn't build props. I didn't build props or make textures. Um, but I did Mm -hmm. like, um, you know, level design art for the whole, you know, for the whole thing. And I would light the whole thing. Um, yeah, not yeah. everybody did that. I just, again, right. Infinity Ward at the time was really good at making sure that if you were, if you had a talent and you had a desire and you could prove it, then you were able to do it. Even though I wasn't an environment artist, yeah. I like pretty much fully arted every level that I worked on there. Oh, that's cool. And and then also the other thing of the idea that there is a, the script that doesn't script lit- do you mean literally all the content? Like there's no enemies in this level until there's nothing. And I mean, we would have reviews while it's being built and we would look at it and Mackie at this point, I'm imagining is going like, can I work, can I make something cool as described in this space? And he's got a lot of freedom to do different Mm -hmm. stuff once he gets in there. And he might say something like, oh, I kind of think I might want to put some people up there if you could just build a balcony up there or whatever. And I would just, you know, okay, cool. I'll do that. And then he can use it if he wants. Right, right. And was this partly because... Whereas you were into the layout thing and you were into the environment art thing, were you not much of a scripter? Like I'm w- w- zero lines of script. Right. Oh, that's another thing because the script in Call of Duty is is code, right? It's written yes. script, which is a whole new world for me because because I got into the industry at least just when Unreal Three was like the new ubiquitous thing, and so for me it was Kismet, 
and visual scripting. Right. But Call of Duty has always been written written lines of. I think um, I've watched other videos uh, about where Muhammad Alavi talked about yeah. thousands of lines of code for uh, like stealth AI and stuff like this, mm-hmm. which yeah, is quite a thing. That, that's wow. So, so that that kind of explains that division then, where you literally just weren't into the scripting side of things. I just did have the skill set. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Interesting. But that strikes me as yeah, just a real surprise for Call of Duty because it seems like with that kind of very scripted cinematic kind of in some ways controlled level design, you'd think that the layout has to be designed really specifically for the content. Like this is where Soap's going to stand before he opens the door. Do you want to tell him, do you want to tell him about how that applied to Cliffhanger in particular? I mean, I remember doing <laughs> I wasn't the one that was supposed to script Cliffhanger, or at least not most of it. I was supposed to just script the climbing part because I had kind of a, Steve and I had, yeah. were really just into climbing for, I don't know, Mission Impossible reasons or something. <laughs> but originally cliffhanger was the sequel to all gillied up it was all about just the right angle for price to stand when he's i mean you remember the level it was very cinematic every beat was kind of set up and that was going to be one of Moe's levels for modern warfare 2 it was you know, yeah. you're going to sneak through this place you're going to have amazing sequences and it wasn't just it what you know it's one of the phrases we use it's like the cake wasn't quite rising it, it wasn't quite different enough from all the gillied up to to really be a standout and this was our first real playable level for modern warfare 2 so it wasn't really setting the tone for mw2 mm-hmm. so um yeah for this level if you think of that if you think of cliffhanger in three major parts there's the climbing well i'll try to go left to right there's the climbing <laughs> and then there's the <laughs> Uh, you've, you're infiltrating the base and you're under the fog and you're doing stealth gameplay, kind of like Metal Gear Solid. And then all, you go into this building where you have to do a bunch of stuff and then all hell breaks loose and you got to run, you got to get on a snow build, you got to escape. So I scripted all the way up till we're stealthing into the place with, and th- so climbing up to the stealth and then stealth ends. In the middle, right. Z had scripted the middle and it was kind of like a, Gosh, we've got this great design and this great level, but it just didn't, the, the, the cake didn't rise. What are we going to do? Hey, hmm. Zia, do you think you can make some Metal Gear go down in this space? And I, I don't remember the exact details, but I think it was probably something along those lines. And yeah, uh, he, that's when the um, heartbeat sensor came in. And we're going to do a yeah. like low range, old school Metal Gear. It's all Metal Gear stuff. And then once they reach the building where they go inside, then my script picks up and I was able to reuse some of those sequences for the original idea about this being the sequel to all gillied up. Like there's a thing with a knife fight or something and a scripted whatever. Um, and yeah, so even though we had that design at the beginning, it doesn't mean that's the design you ship, even though it was in McCord's head as he built it. Once you actually go to do it with all the best intentions, it doesn't always get where you wanted it to go. So you have to be flexible, move pieces around, make something, yeah. make it good. That's what's important about the ownership piece is because once it went to Mackie and Z and these guys to work on it, I didn't, I wasn't in the room every day going like, let me see what you're doing. Oh, that's not what I had planned here. You should try to make it work. I was just watching it happen. I was like, look what they're doing to the cool level. Like look, they're making this level come alive that I built. And I didn't think that that's not what I thought would happen here, but that's cooler than what I thought, you know, like, and they could just do whatever they it's like the classic, you know, you're you're more creative with, with some boundaries, right? And they had the boundaries of a level that they had to work with because it was done. It was, I was just fixing bugs or maybe even past that. Right, right. So it would be think- really quick. There's a key part of that that's so easy to miss, which is that not only was McCord like, oh, cool, look what they're doing. There was no and never a point where Zeod or I would turn to McCord or even Steve and go, do we have permission to make this change? Because we mm-hmm. had responsibility and, you know, we were responsible for that outcome too. You know, ultimately it's right. Jason West, the game director, watching the whole thing to see if the right people are working on the right stuff, if it's going the right way. But it's not a constant permission check to whoever previously supplied that piece. It's a, you got it now. And one right. of my favorite examples of, of taking full control of that is I know the snowmobile section. Yeah. The snowmobile <laughs> section, I'm like... I want a big finish. I want to really just get adrenaline going. So I took McCord's Geo of a snowmobile ride and I just took this one part. I stretched. I made this huge hill. I just kept making it longer and longer and longer. Comically and- long. 
comic book like, like deep like like I had to move the whole level south to fit more snowmobile section into the level and and then and then like spike it with a jump into the air and like Joel Emsley the the lead artist he's just like this is ridiculous too comical and and then it's like the chord okay I, I kind of messed up your level a little bit you gotta can you please come back and make this look nice. Yeah, yeah so. <laughs> it gave me this slope, that slope at the end that you just barrel down, and I was like, "What am I supposed to do with this?" But I mean, it looks like it, like nothing that would be real ever. And <laughs> right, right. But in the when you play it, the experience is like, "Oh, I know what yeah. this is," and now I've got to touch a tree. Exactly. And, yeah. and so I don't like the way it ended. It it looks weird. It looks fake. But right, right. It's fun to play, yeah, and so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, wow. So, what did you? So, did you say that there wasn't? Did you even intend there to be a snowmobile chase at the end? Was that no. was that made by the scriptors? Like, Mac- no. The snow. He McCord built the snowmobile geo. Okay. I mean, this, the intent okay. was a ride snowmobile, but I didn't like the the way it kind of ended in the kind of plateau. Right. I wanted a, a bigger build up, so that wasn't even in the original design. The design always had the snowmobile. I just wanted to punctuate it. I it was just, just a wanted a right. yeah. license. In some respects, it's almost like me as scriptor being at the end of the trip. I just kind of suffered from this a little where I'm at the end of the, the chain tr- or whatever, mm. the train, I guess. And I want to put my own personal mark on it. Even though I did get to script it, I want, I want to, you know, I almost feel compelled. I need to add something to it that wasn't there before or imagined <laughs> before to really feel mm. like I, I, you know, that's just how I am. So I, there's a couple cases right. throughout the levels that I worked on, right? I kind of had to, I got to tweak this. Right. I don't, even if people don't know this, I have to do something to the geo, like Gulag, I had to do some stuff more for the sake of my own need to do it then i don't know if it's necessarily ultimately for the best but well i think that climax is especially for the purpose of an e3 demo as well but it just is when you play it, it's like that climax makes it yeah you know, it's the cherry on the cake right yeah. uh, that's that's but that's super interesting that you mentioned that the um the motion tracker the, the heartbeat sensor yeah, the heartbeat sensor that was a late uh, wasn't part of the original yeah. of my memory i, I believe i could be wrong about anything it's it's one of those things where like when you play it, it's like oh this is the mo- the heartbeat sense a bit and it and it feels like well they I assumed it's like oh they were so smart in designing like with the fog and plus the heartbeat sensor it just makes sense right and and the heartbeat sensor wouldn't make sense if it wasn't for the fog yeah so I assumed was already built. You know, level was already built it came from aliens right I yeah, think yeah. it was the fog I think the original idea was Morpheus telling you that there's a guy in the building and you shoot in the building but that wasn't working out because you couldn't, you know, he couldn't, I don't know, for whatever reason it wasn't working out. And so we started brainstorming ideas of how to make that work better. And the tracker right, was, right. was what came from that. Hmm, that's cool. It's, it's funny how when you hear about those things, it's like, it reminds me of like how apparently in like Gears of War didn't have a cover system until the last six months of the game. And they would like, this should have like, apparently Cliffy, Cliffy was like, this should have a cover in it. And they were like, oh man, you're right. And then they spent like six months like crunching the hell out of it to get that game done. But then it just completely defines the game. It didn't yeah. just elevate it, but it completely defined the game. Um, hmm. So that, that's a lot of stuff in there that was like very different to what I'm used to as, in terms of level design. Like for what it's worth, like every, every game I've been a level designer on, whether it's like, like straight up shooters like uh, Bulletstorm or a stealthy big kind of thing like Dishonored, the level designer does. Not everything, but certainly le- layout and scripting is has always been done by the same person because to me it seems like they're so in a in a more scripted game like Bulletstorm, it's like the level designer designs this room so that they can spawn this guy behind the wall when the player walks here, you know, and, that, and that really specific stuff like that. So it's 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 really surprising and interesting to me to hear that yeah, cliffhanger and, and modern warfare levels in general, the the layouts were done kind of presumably you, you talked about an ex some kind of intended experience, like you say, but the idea that the script just comes into an empty, a cool looking, but empty level and makes it, brings it alive. Is really I, I, I got I to mention really quick. There's sometimes where like the th- prototype level for Call of Duty one was the Chateau and I came in to script it and the level designer through a failing between bo- a mutual failing. I didn't actually know what the point of the level was or the flow. My script tried to script it to make it good and tried to own it. And that's why I discovered at the end of it that it already did have a design. I just never heard about it. And I had to go re-script it. Oh, no. <laughs> and it made so much more sense. I'm like, oh, I get the level right. now. So that's kind of like it, amazing such a world-class snafu could transpire. But yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that's part of what when you're building a level, you, you know that, you know, there's, there's going to be a fight 
here, you know, and, and so, you know, that the script is going to need options. You need, they're, they're going to need, you know, where can these, and Mackie and I have been these conversations all the time. you like, well, where do you think I'm going to spawn guys? I'm like, well, I think, and you can bring them from over the hill, from back here, from around the building there. And he's like, well, the building's not going to work because the player could be there and see it. And he's like, okay, well, I'll build a, I'll build an interior to the building and they can come out of the interior or whatever, you know, like we would, we would talk mm-hmm. about that stuff. At this point, this is mm-hmm. my fourth Call of Duty game and, you know, like Mackie's fourth, I think. And so it's like, we've made yeah, there's a, lot a lot of, of like, how to set up a combat scenario is like, yeah, pretty second nature yeah, at that yeah. point. Like the, similar instincts and stuff. Yeah. The thing that happened that made, that enabled those levels to be their best selves was this kind of casting that the game director did where he was able to say, we've got these levels and we've got these talented scriptures. What's the right places to connect the dots to make a really great game. And if it's the same person building it and then scripting it, you lose that flexibility. So like I said, there are times where the same person does it. Like I think Chad Grenier built and scripted the AC-130 for um, COD-4. And and sometimes, you know, the same person might script and then light it like Mo- Muhammad on, on All Gillied Up. But mm-hmm. that flexibility, that's like the key thing that makes it, sh- makes it, guarantees like the right person in the right place or even just to try it and jason west used to always say you are not your level so if it wasn't if there's something wrong with the level it's not your fault you're not your level you can take the feedback you can incorporate it um and maybe ultimately the person on the level changes to somebody else and that would happen sometimes going all the way back to medal of honor and it was okay because you're not your level but the level needs the right person to bring it to life and it's not it's not gonna be the right every person it's going to be different for each level who that right person ultimately is. And that, you know, that played out really strongly on the Titanfall two campaign where it's like this super awesome inventive level. That's going to build itself while you're in it probably needs the most technically oriented available designer, which would be Chad Grenier again to bring it Mm -hmm. to life. So that flexibility, that casting ability contributed a lot to helping those campaigns stand out. But then you do get when you get the when you get a cut like it's rare in my experience when you find the person that can do both i won't i'll say in my experience you know like on our teams the people that can do both end up making very strongly visioned levels and those levels are awesome because it is because it's all them you know like hmm. Did he, thing, build the cargo ship? did he build the cargo ship or just, yeah, I feel like somebody else might've built the cargo ship, but then Mo like sure. found a level within it and, and designed, essentially rebuilt to do it. I mostly think right. of Titanfall two. when I think of this, when I think of Jake Keating working on, uh, effect and cause, effect and, cause yeah. and, um, and Mohammed Alavi working on, um, yeah, ship to ship. Uh, yeah, I forget what the name of, that the wow. player facing name was, but the dead name right. was ship to ship. And he built it and scripted it and owned it from the nothing existed to the final ship product. And you just get such a like solid vision that doesn't waver when you get that one person that can do everything. Yeah. When so, when Mackie, when me and Mackie's relationship, you know, we worked on cliffhanger and on uh, gulag and those levels are like that that's like dual directors or something, you know, you get like multiple person, multiple people's angles on the thing at different times. Yeah, it, it's the when you mentioned sure. the game director doing this casting and kind of choosing people, <clears throat> on maybe nudging people towards certain roles on certain levels. Was that was that Steve Fukuda? By any chance? No, was that, that was that was Jason West. I, I'll never Jason forget. West, right? I I wanted so bad to script the COD four level where the, the the tank runs over the truck because when we were coming up with moments, that was such a, an epic moment in our heads. And then I didn't. I was working so hard to finish Bog A so I could do Bog B where the tank is going to run over the truck but i wasn't fast enough so jason's like chad you do bog b and it's like oh he only left it dangling just to get me to work so hard on bog a <laughs> <laughs> oh well <laughs> i mean okay because that the reason the reason i um uh was wondering if it was steve fukuda is because i've watched a video where muhammad talks about um uh working on all gillied up and he said for a long time, 
he was aware of that mission and it was the one where you're kind of sneaking around and stuff. And he was like, I don't want to work on that mission. That sounds really boring. Like there's no action in it and all this kind of stuff. And apparently, just like you said, Steve Fukuda pitched him on it and said, imagine at the start of the level, you're by a bush. And then suddenly the bush t- stands up and looks at you and talks to you. And he, and he said, he's like, that was it. I, I got the level. And it's, it's exactly like you say. He's like, we totally yeah. had a vision for it. And, you know, just a, a, an interesting tangent about that level was that as a team, as a design team, we all voted on which levels from all the pitches we thought we should do. And that level was the least voted for. And Steve said, uh-huh. screw that. We're doing that level. Um, but it was generally, it was generally Jason making the final call on the, who worked on which level. Like I remember right. him just Gulag had already started and Jason's like, you really need to be the one doing it. You need to do Gulag. Yeah. I'm like, right. well, uh, I don't need to, you, you, and he'd do this sort of thing for a day or two. And it's like, okay, I guess I'm doing Gulag. But it seemed like from my vantage point, like it was such a mountain, it was such a long, like that's, I don't know if I have, I'm already making other stuff. I don't know if I can climb that mountain, but once you get going and you're rolling, it all starts to, all starts you to didn't climb. want to work on Gulag Mackie. <laughs> how dare you i mean I, I don't, what was it about it's already started and it was it was funny because it was you and it was you and sean and i'm like they got such a cool dynamic the two of them they're they're like you know they're like brothers from from treyarch, from treyarch. Like, <laughs> they're let's have them have their awesome duo level like the old days and make it happen and i don't think sean and i ever worked on a level together actually like the <laughs> you started working on oh you made a track you did it yeah Okay. I mean, even Gulag, I forgot he worked on, I forgot he started it. So close. Was there, I was always curious about the, um, the relationship between Treyarch and Infinity Ward. Like, um, so you <laughs> came. Evil. It's kind of like Breaking Bad. Uh, anyway. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what it's like now. <laughs> right. At the time like, it was, it was like, they were, I, they were like making the good stuff and we were like, trying to copy them and we didn't right. we didn't think we were great we didn't think we were good really we were trying to make and i'm i'm speaking for the group of people that i hung around i was gonna say which era yeah. are we talking about here this at, is at this point mid 2000s this, yeah this is end of the end of the 2000s um co- as soon as they started taking over call of duty really like the mm. first call of duty that they worked on that i that i also worked on was um it's Call of Duty 2, Big Red 1 for the PlayStation 2 and other things. Um, right. And, you know, they were working on Call of Duty 2 at the time. And then, I mean, those differences are huge, right? Call of Duty 2 is awesome. And Big Red 1 is like, kind of whatever. And so, and then we got <laughs> Call of Duty 3. Holy crap, we get a real number. We get a, you know, and that felt like, that felt like we were stealing something from them. And then we would hear like little things like they were upset that Activision gave <laughs> Treyarch the number, you know? And so it's like <laughs> this sort of like, and we had never met, none of us had ever met. So it was just sort of this like, mm, fuck you and fuck yeah. you, you know? Like, it was like a yeah, very, sibling rivalry that was kind of encouraged. And just two little interesting historic facts about that. When we were starting Call of Duty 2, Activision said, hey, can you do this in a year? Because if you can do it in a year, you guys can keep the numbered games. And they and Kirk would be like the dot, the colon, whatever's. And we started doing it and we got into it. And then as we're building, we're like, this is not going to be good enough. We're, we're, Zia and Steve and I sat down, we're like, no, we are, we need two years. And so as a result, um, they said, okay, well, the Treyarch's going to do the, the, the games. They're going to release every even numbered year. You guys will get the odd numbered years. And we started COD 4 thinking we were making Call of Duty 3. So internally, it's called COD 3 in the internal IW3. repo files. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, it was slash COD 3. It was oh, really? straight up. We all thought we were making COD 3 the whole time. <laughs> and, um, and then COD 3 came out. And it was like... <laughs> so, we, had I mean, I we would have had to sacrifice Call of Duty 2 and probably wouldn't have been able to make Call of Duty 4 at the quality that would have broken through like it did. Um, but as a result, we had to share the franchise in that way. All right. I mean, I can imagine that would be, especially if you as teams didn't meet very often or at all. Certainly my experience of every time a studio I've worked in has worked with another studio, like a, uh, supporting us on level design or whatever, for no reason, even if things are fine and everybody's great, 
there's just reasons why it's kind of snark builds up because there's just this invisible people working on that thing over there. Uh And and especially if it affects your work, it just kind of, and then you meet them in real life and you realize, oh, everybody's really nice and everybody's cool. But it's just like when you're working and like I said, it's just the other people over there in the other studio. I can tell you. Two other quick ones. One, I did go to the COD3 launch party. I was there in like the back when they're going, yeah, Treyarch, you're the only ones that could have made a COD in a year. And I'm like... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay i guess that's true i guess that's an accurate statement nice. that's and um and then the other one was i actually did i i spent a lot of energy basically convincing i, I knew i had gotten to know mike denny a little bit he was um at gray matter and when i had introduced how to make a cod level to him and the other gray matter guys so they could make united offensive and then they got swept up into treyarch and I, so I had kept in contact with him and i was basically trying to convince them you really should use our tech because the techs had diverged you should come back to the the main line and use what we've developed because it's got all this great stuff. A lot of, you know, and, and you know, sort of greedily, uh, I had made, I did a lot of editor and tools stuff and I wanted them to be using that for their games too. So eventually through Denny and from other avenues, Treyarch was convinced we're going to shift to the COD 4 tech for Jason could probably tell us whatever title that was. That maybe was World, World War. War. Yeah. And, but I was always on ICQ with Denny back then, always like sort of be in the Call of Duty help desk for how to, he was like my mirror person on the Treyarch side. So I, he, if he needed help understanding something that just to keep them in the know, we had that relationship going through World of War and whatever, whenever that started um, and eventually hired him at a W. So, um, so there was, there, it wasn't like there was really zero and it was like, it was all at each other. It was just, there was, it was hard to feel like you created this IP and then have to share it. And it's not Treyarch's fault yeah. that, was hard, that that was hard. That's just the nature of the beast. Well, and we were making, I can totally imagine. we were making games in six to nine months. And so they weren't as good quality. And so they were bringing the IP down. And, um, but I mean, I think that, I think that the disposition changed a bit whenever they hired me. And then they hired Sean Slayback and then Chris Dion and then, and then Paul Sandler, all these guys from Treyarch came over to infinity ward and made Modern Warfare two with them. So and how, how did they feature you? How, how were you featured in, in world of war, Jason? <laughs> yeah, I left, I left halfway through world at war and they, they weren't super thrilled about that. And all right. You know, I got the, <laughs> I got the classic, uh, uh, credits, um, dig of, uh, additional Special design effects. or or whatever yeah, it was, yeah. you know, sure. which I was the lead designer on that project for six months or so. Um, oh, wow. Okay. I see. And uh, you know, that'll never be credit that I get, which is fine, but it was, it was like a pretty big hit to see it go down to special thanks at the end of the credit. Yeah, and then they, uh, and then Mike Denny put me in the, um, put my name in the, one of the videos for the loading of the, of one of the levels that i that I built where I was MIA and it was funny. Lots of little, like, I think that was friendly though. I think that was friendly. Like, like let's poke fun at McCord cause he left us halfway through the game. <laughs> yeah. That's it. It is. I mean, yeah, hopefully that was a friendly thing, but like it is a thing with the games industry in it that, that credits can be like the snipiest, snarkiest things where it's like, Oh, the, all these people just special thanks. Yeah. Like it's, it's all you get. It's, if you do anything, but ship the game, you know, I built like four levels like, in that campaign and I got additional things. Well, I actually appreciate that, uh, respawn does it differently and that apex credits have like a, and here's people that aren't here anymore. And here's what they did. Hmm. Nice. That's cool. One question in general that I think, uh, comes from the way people talk about Call of Duty, uh, like one of, one of its big questions that it brings up is like you know some people feel like with that much when when levels are scripted to the degree that a call of duty level is scripted Mm -hmm. you know some people will feel like it there's less agency i'm really curious to hear what your takes on that are in terms of what what's doing it right and what's not doing it right in terms of you know controlling an experience versus empowering Mm -hmm. a player to play in multiple ways and stuff like, like say, for example, Cliffhanger, I think, does a great job of creating a linear experience, which is engaging, just, you know, regardless of it being linear. I'm curious. To I would argue that, a lot of- that middle part of that level has a lot of agency. That Zia's yeah. full spy section and yeah. going through the, you go whichever way you want, non-linear style, yeah. into the fog, and you have to work your way through it. 
yeah, it's mm. controlled that the game changed to that tone, but that part is a very yeah. you know, agency that was, an, part. That was one of the goals that I remember from you guys when I was tasked to work on it was we want the game to start, we want the game to feel like it has areas that have more ways to play it than just, you know. Oh, wide here wide here. linear too. Wide linear was what we called wide it, linear. yeah. <laughs> I mean, we use that term on Dishonored as well. Yeah, Dishonored we think of as wide tunnels, wide pipes. Yeah. Like what, yeah, same thing. Um, yeah, and to me, even, even with, like, you know, for example, the snowmobile thing, completely, like, literally, like, Mackie's two-mile-long mountain, <laughs> right? It's linear. But then, to me, the 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 point there is that you are really driving the snowmobile. Like, uh, yeah. Cause there's, I feel like there's, other, there's even other Call of Duty levels, uh, like, in later games, where there's similar sequences with like high speed vehicle stuff, but where the player isn't really doing as much. And to me, that's the point is that like, you know, linear or not, the player is driving that snowmobile there, yeah. you know, and that you can, you can die if you crash into a tree. And I want to actually test it for just a second. If I could just, just mm. jump in there. Sure. Such a, this, this is area is very near and dear to my heart. I know this is very, yeah. hard, this is the hardest scripting right here for me. And I, and you know, it kind of goes back to Half-Life, which did a very good job of not really taking control away. It's you that pushes the thing into the whatever sets off the chain reaction. And to me, it was critical as the scripter that you maintain that feeling of control and mm. realism and that it's not just a game. So throughout any level I ever worked on, there's there's moments and pieces that really fight the urge to put the controller down and watch. Like if, as you're riding into Stalingrad and Call of Duty 1, if you don't crouch when all the other guys crouch and the plane strafe, you're going to get shot and die because I don't want you to, I want you always mentally thinking, okay, there's scripting going on, whatever, but I, I'm really still playing this. Like when you're in Modern Warfare 2 and Price, you see Price struggling and he goes to punch you, the controller still allows you to try to pull away from the punch and your view will move with it. And um, just any, you know, one of, another example would be like in Modern Warfare 2, there's a point where you are in a car, you're not driving the car, a Jeep, but then the driver gets shot and killed and you reach out and grab the steering wheel. You now have to actually steer. And if you go try to steer right off, you will crash and die. But once you get just close enough to the plane that's taking off, at some point, yeah, I do merge out and merge into the plane controlling you and getting you on there. But you had to do... Even though this is the only section of the game where you got to drive with one hand or whatever, it has to feel like you're still really doing it, or the the game loses something. So I was kind of just a stickler about that, and I would look for the places in the game where that was missing and try to inject it. And I don't think that everybody shares that. And also, that was a lot of the work. Like that, it's hard to not just think of the stuff, but actually make non-traditional sequences feel like you're in control and make the player feel like they're in control when they're essentially not and to find the right balance of a fail condition that's not what you don't want is i'm going to play that stalingrad boat ride three times because i didn't crouch correctly you don't want to make it into dragon's lair so yeah. um i i think it's tricky i think it's worth it i don't think it's done that much because i think when it comes to like dollars and cents it's not actually that important it's almost just like an extra I, I know what you mean you know I, so, you i'm really glad you said that because i feel the same way like it's 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 this thing where it's a lot of work and to people who get it it is it elevates it and it's really important it's like the point it's the whole point to me that you the experience of playing it feels like you did it and you didn't just watch a cool animation right mm -hmm. and yet like you say in terms of pure development time cost and stuff it's maybe not worth it because when you think about how many people would be okay with the less interactive version? But I agree, it's it's the it's the whole point to me. I'm not saying weeks and weeks on like cool. that COD four scene where you're sniping and making it developing this whole thing where I was controlling the bullet with the wind and the flags because that would make it so that you actually had to wait until the right time to snipe, but make it feel believable that you missed. So there's like tons of and a whole extra system and tons of layering of script work to make the outcome I wanted to have happen, happen organically instead of forced. And we're just watching the movie. I mean, even the cliffhanger climb, I, I think in a modern oh, yeah. game, it would very easily just be a couple of this and then over the edge and then the gun comes up and now you have control. But the whole, I mean, so many meetings, so many uh, meetings between me and, and Mackie and, and Steve talking about like, 
okay, this trigger does this, this trigger, does, should we be able to go to the side? Should we be able to be freeform this whole cliff or just go straight? Like it was all about playing that. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I, I want to riff on that one a second because I, I should have thought about that one since this is a cliffhanger discussion, but yeah, that's, there was no climbing system in call of duty. That was all script. But I, but since we didn't like McCord saying, we didn't know precisely how we wanted to play out. We started from a more ambitious place where you're really almost doing like an old school Spider-Man arcade game, climb up the cliff. And I scripted. So you had the left and the right, and you used to be able to go sideways too, and up and back. And it was a whole complicated scripting mechanism on top of that. And it would actually do animation blends for the left side and the right side. And then the script is weight, sending the blend weights and then simulating you going up the cliff. Um, same actually sort of similar thing for, for the sniper Call of Duty mission where you had to carry Price or you were Price, you had to carry McMillan and he would drop down and turn into a turret. And it's all scripted, but all to create that feeling like you're really getting him out of there and, and you're doing the gameplay. But it's like scripting behaviors. It's like scripting systems to make this linear one little slice in time really feel believable. Yeah, yeah. And where there's still room for the player to kind of push around in the boundaries, like to, to, yeah, to make it feel like it's a genuinely interactive thing. I, I agree about that. I was in my video, I'm planning on kind of geeking out about the climbing section, like for two, two reasons. One of them is that, like, like say, Jason, in a lot, of, a lot of other studios and a lot of other games, including one I've worked on, would do the kind of the lazy version of that climbing thing. Like, I, so I worked on Bulletstorm and we have sections where you climb across, you kind of do the monkey bars across these sections. And in our version of that, because it was way less lower budget and we did it quick and all this kind of stuff, you know, left trigger appears on, the icon appears on the screen, you press it and then you press the right one and then you press the left one. You can't do anything wrong. The game tells you exactly what you have to do. And yeah, it's just, you're just pressing buttons to push through an animation. Whereas everything about the the climbing the cliff right down to the fact that there's no ui but and you also have you you push the right trigger to push your right arm into the ice and then you can see i love how you can see the ice break and it feels like oh if i if i just hold on to my even if i just hold on to my button this will break and i'll fall so i can die like and, and it's st little details like that to me completely make it and it's one of the little things i'm geeking out about in the video is that um, without you know any disrespect to the people who worked on the remaster because the remaster is really impressive and uh, but that but just like you say Jason there's little especially when you're trying to increase the graphical fidelity of this stuff and you want you want soap to be more fully animated and all this stuff little I, I can imagine the kind of meetings they had about like the compromises you make on the interactive mm -hmm. side there's because you know in the new version for example right at the start of the level you you are in a kind of scripted mode straight away and you kind of you can see your legs which you can in the original i don't know oh, well, can you i think you have body presence in the no that was always a debate you don't. no no right legs. right no legs. right no. so so in the new one you can and it's fully animated and you're kind of in place and they've basically controlled it so you can press forwards and it will play a, an animation of you leaning and if you hold it down you'll fall off so you can still fall off but mm -hmm. when you press right it plays a kind of it reminds me of the they do it in uncharted a lot where they plays a canned animation of him sliding yeah. across Whereas in the original, you, you have free movement and you, it's, it's your job to make sure you don't fall off the cliff when yeah. you kind of creep around. Little things like that, I just feel like... And it feels so I scary, right? Because that cliff that you're walking on feels like I shouldn't yeah. be able to... If I just... I don't know how far it is before I'm falling off. And that's what yeah, feels yeah. scary versus when they do the animations, you're like, oh, I'm pretty much locked here unless I... Yeah, I, I don't have to worry about this, yeah. which is... The complete opposite of the experience you're after, right? You want to be the player to be feeling like, wow, this is, I've never done this before. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad you geeked out on that, Mackie, because that's, that's dear to my heart as well, this stuff. I feel like it's, it's whoever is, is sort of directing that game is either trying to make a movie or trying to make a game. Like that's, yeah, yeah. That's really a reductive way of putting it, but I feel like a lot of times it comes down to like, what are your priorities here? Are you trying to, you're just trying to sell this thing that, you know, I, I can imagine the like director playing it and they fail once and they're like, eh, people will fail here. This is that just ruined it for me. Let's just it should really be like cinematic. Like, you know. Yeah, yeah. It should look like it I've watched nice. people. You should have seen how many times I watch people fail to snipe the cave. Like they get the sniper rifle. They're like, oh, cool. Bang. Oh, I died. And it took so much work to make that the fail, 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 not be the default. Like you, it was, we called it Kleenex testing. We'd sit somebody down and watch them play. We're not allowed to talk to them. 
And that's the experience they have. And if it's bad, you're going back to your office and trying to fix it for tomorrow. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. fix, fix, fix. But it was the hard road, but the worth road. Yeah, yeah. I, I know, like, I, I phrased the, the thing you were talking about, Jason, in terms of like, is it, is the cool stuff happening on the screen or is it happening in the player's head? Yeah. Because that's the, the thing, right? When I think about that sort of animation driven content that a lot of games um, do in, in first person you know i think it really it kind of bothers me when games go a little too hard on the first person uh yeah making everything be a first person animation i think about titanfall and the way that it the way that it feels when you're wall running is like i feel like another game you might they might go a little harder on like the camera and make you really feel like a pop 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 but when you yeah. but when you play titanfall it's really smooth and it feels gamey that way, right? In a lot of ways, mm. but it also feels really, res- really responsive and really like. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's about you know, like you prioritize responsivity rather than the cinematic camera kind of. Yeah, thing. when I hit jump, I'm gonna jump that second, not wait for an animation to go like, you know, which then makes yeah, it yeah. look cooler, maybe, but it doesn't feel right. Yeah, yeah, totally. 